Hello, my name is Travis Monk. This is one part of a series of videos involving ecology. This video will discuss, in detail, the population level of ecology. As the graphic above shows, populations can change significantly over time. Over the last 50 years, the total population of humans on Earth has increased dramatically, shown in the relative sizes of the pie charts. The percentage of the population of humans under 19, shown in blue, and over 65, in yellow, has increased over the last 50 years. The same is projected for the next 50 years. This video will focus on population ecology vocabulary and means of measuring or estimating populations, as well as population statistics using examples and graphics, such as the one exhibited on this slide. A population can be defined as a group of individuals of one particular species that are found in a specific location in one particular time. When it comes to describing a particular population, boundaries, or the borders, the limits, of that population must be chosen. Sometimes the boundary of a population can be very simple to define, as shown in the picture of the pond to the right. Since all the fish are confined within the pond, that would make an excellent boundary to describe the population living there. If you are interested in studying the deer present in a region, however, things might not be so clear because they are more free to move about. Sometimes, boundaries must be arbitrarily chosen by the ecologist studying the population. An ecologist could, for example, study the population of deer in the state of Iowa, even though deer may be free to move across an imaginary line that you could draw separating Iowa from Minnesota or Kansas. While measuring the size of a population might seem like a pretty straightforward task, it's often impossible to measure each individual. While each member of the human population living in the United States is measured by its census every 10 years, that's not realistic for other species. If you were to try to count the number of mice in a field, for example, they would be less likely to cooperate and more likely to move around. One technique that's commonly used to estimate the population size of animals is referred to as a mark recapture technique. In short, scientists would capture a significant number of individuals in a population and mark them using some semi-permanent and recognizable method. The top picture shows a fish being tagged using this type of technique. Animals are then released unharmed back in the environment, and a few days later the scientists would try to catch more individuals of the same population. Using math and statistics, the approximate size of that population can be estimated. For large populations of non-moving or sedentary organisms, such as plants, a different technique can be used called a quadrat sampling technique. Using this method, you can measure the number of individuals in a small rectangle, or quadrat, shown in the bottom picture. Using many sample areas, you could estimate the population in an area that it would be otherwise unrealistic to count. There are separate videos explaining the math behind the quadrat sampling and mark recapture population estimation techniques. Dispersion can be defined as the spatial distribution of individuals within a population. The dispersion of populations can be described as regular, random, or clumped. An example of a regularly distributed population might be apple trees in an orchard. If you were to look for wildflowers in a field, you might find them randomly dispersed. Schools of fish or herds of buffalo might provide an excellent example of clumped populations in nature. A separate video on quadrat sampling describes how you can mathematically determine if a population is regular, random, or clumped. This slide defines population density as the number of individuals per unit area, or unit space. This graphic shows the population density of every county in the United States. As you can see in the picture, the population density in each county differs significantly, from less than one person per square mile to nearly 70,000 people per square mile. The human population is clumped, as you see in this picture, around bodies of water. Smaller populations are less able to adapt to changing environmental conditions, making them more susceptible to extinction. With a smaller population and a shallow gene pool, there is also a greater chance to acquire recessive genetic disorders due to inbreeding. For some of the same reasons, small populations can be very susceptible to specific diseases. These topics are explained and described further in units on genetics and evolution. A separate video entitled Conservation Ecology will discuss populations that are very small in size, such as the endangered western lowland gorilla shown in this picture. The graphics shown to the right are referred to as age structures. 
What they show, in particular, is the gender and age makeup of a population. The x-axis shows the percentage of the population of each gender, while the y-axis breaks down that population into different age groups. Highlighted in blue on the graphic are the primary reproductive ages, individuals most likely to produce offspring. These graphics are most useful for predicting future population growth. The more pyramid-like the graphic is, the more individuals there are, or will be, in the primary reproductive ages. The pyramid-like age structure of Mexico could be expected to rapidly increase in size, while the uniform structure of Sweden would forecast a stable or shrinking population. Countries like China, with a very large population growth, and Russia, with a very low population growth, have instated policies to try to slow down or speed up population growth. China has its one-child laws, while Russia has had national holidays with prizes if parents have children on specific dates. There are two general classifications of regulation that can cause a population to fluctuate, that is, increase or decrease, in size. These factors can be caused by living or biotic factors, or non-living, that is, abiotic factors. Density-dependent forms of regulation rely upon the population density. These forms of regulation usually involve a shortage of something, such as nesting space or food availability. The number of snowshoe hair, shown on the right, would affect the number of lynx that could survive in that environment. This form of regulation usually involves biotic factors. Density-independent factors are not related to the number of individuals per unit space. It wouldn't matter if the population size was 10 or 100,000, individuals would be equally susceptible to death. An example of a density-independent form of regulation might be a natural disaster such as flooding or especially low seasonal temperatures. This form of regulation usually involves abiotic factors. The graphic shown on this slide depicts the density-dependent form of regulation described just a moment ago. The x-axis shows a wide time range, while the y-axis measures the number of snowshoe hair and links in a population in thousands. The, po the populations here visibly fluctuate up and down. The red arrow in this picture points to a time when the population of snowshoe hare was very high. What you might notice from this graph, indicated by the blue arrow, is that the population of lynx increased dramatically a couple short years later. The number of hare was an example of a resource of which there could be a shortage, a density dependent factor regulating the population size of the lynx. There are two different models of population growth that will be described in the next two slides. What these models of growth attempt to explain is how a population with a positive growth rate increases in size over a period of time. The exponential model of growth, shown in this slide, describes how a population can grow in conditions where there are no limiting factors. While this model of population growth is not realistic long term, what is observed is a very rapid growth rate sometimes expressed using the letter R. The larger the population gets, the faster it increases in size, as suggested by the greater and greater slope to the line as time goes on. Examples of this pattern of growth would be observed in the human population over the last 250 years, or bacterial population growth on a petri dish during the first few days. The logistic model is a more realistic representation of population growth because it takes into account limiting factors of a population. These limiting factors, food or nesting space, for example, act to suppress, that is, hold down, the population size. The largest population that the environment can sustain because of these limiting resources is called the population's carrying capacity and is represented in this graphic by the letter K. As you can see in this graphic, no population can increase in size forever. This model of growth shows that while a population can increase in size very quickly in the short term, as the population size comes closer and closer to the carrying capacity, the growth rate, or slope of the line, begins to level off. What makes this topic even more confusing is that the carrying capacity of a population can change over time. There is a separate video on the math behind calculating exponential and logistic population growth. Populations of organisms show different patterns of mortality how likely or unlikely an organism is to die during different stages of their potential lifespan. Their survivorship curves to the right exhibit three general patterns that organisms can fit into. Type 1 survivorship curves are usually exhibited by K-selected species, 
which are organisms that put a lot of care and invest a lot of resources into their offspring. Case-selected species, like humans, usually have few offspring throughout their lifetime. Due to the tremendous amount of care provided to those few offspring, most of those individuals uh, in that particular species live to see the end of their potential life. I would guess that over 95% of humans in the United States survive to adulthood. Case-selected species usually survive quite well in established environments when the ecosystem is near the carrying capacity, hence the letter K. Other organisms employ a different strategy. They try to produce as many offspring as possible during their lifetime, but provide very little or no postnatal care. Species that show a type 3 pattern of mortality are sometimes referred to as R-selected species. Because very little care is provided to the offspring, the vast majority of these individuals do not survive to the end of their potential life. Using the plants in the graphic to the right, for example, less than 1% of the potential offspring produced may live to see their adult form. Our selected species do an excellent job colonizing new environments. R stands for growth rate. These individuals have very high growth rates. Type 2 species, as shown in this picture, would have about an equally likely chance of dying at any point in their life. There have been many projections about the future of the human population, many involving the carrying capacity of humans. The problem is that with so many variables, even a rough estimate can be difficult to make. The previous slide suggested that the carrying capacity of a population can change over time, further complicating matters. With advances such as the Industrial Revolution or new agricultural techniques, for example, the carrying capacity of humans on Earth could and has increased before. That is the end of this video summarizing the population level of ecology. If you're interested in learning about any other levels of ecology or any other themes of biology, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you.